Hello, welcome to the November segment of A View into the Collection. My name is Amy Johnson and I am the Curator of Collections at the Indian Pueblo Cultural Center. I always look forward to sharing artwork from our permanent collection with you. During the month of November, we commemorate and observe Native American Heritage Month. This month, I wish to share with our viewers a variety of more contemporary works of art by Pueblo, Hopi, Navajo, and Choctaw artists. Much of our collection of art is donated to the center and within some of these donations are beautifully crafted treasures. I want to honor our Native American tribes here in the American, in the American Southwest and beyond. So join me for another view into our collection. Cultural expression is like a story told and retold, but with added embellishment. An artist's imagination and desire for invention allows for variations on common themes. Contemporary art reflects an artist's current state of mind. Like dropping a rock in water, the single point creates continuous circles radiating outward. A contemporary Native American artist can represent that single drop in a pool of water and the circles form a number of influences on their art making process. Ideas, values, interests, and the artist's environment blend together and inform their work. Contemporary Native American art can be described as creative, innovative, forward thinking, and modern. While maintaining elements of tribal traditions and cultures, the jump toward a modern approach to art making brings forth a number of remarkable works. Take for example, this work by Tony Hahola of Isleta Pueblo. Tony Hahola, recognized as a master of blown and sculpted glass, is a graduate of the Institute of American Indian Arts. Hahola finds inspiration for his blown glass vessels in the traditionally clay form bowl and jar shapes of Pueblo pottery. The grandson of a potter, Hohola enjoys infusing traditional forms into brilliant new incarnations. His utilization of glass, as opposed to clay, transforms a familiar form into something familiar yet different. The variety of translucent colors available provide a wider color palette from the natural slip paints used to decorate pottery. He finds the Pueblo's traditional reliance on community cooperation mirrored in the teamwork required to produce works in glass. And he sees a natural connection between glass and pottery in that both have fire as an essential element. One of a handful of Native American artists who work in glass, Hohola is a founder of Taos Glass Arts and Education, through which members of Taos Pueblo are learning to produce glass artwork in an effort to stimulate economic, creative, and cultural benefits for their community. He believes in the potential of glass as a powerful and expressive new medium for Native artists. Quote, I can see an enormous market potential out in the country for glass artwork by Native Americans. The need is there, believe me. If only more young artists would get interested in glass, there would suddenly be a new way for people to support themselves. End quote. Another blown glass creation was made by Ira Lujan of Taos Pueblo and Okeo Winge. His glass buffalo figure echoes the traditional stone carved fetishes first created by Zuni Pueblo artisans. His buffalo includes a turquoise blue heart line and a parrot feather tied around the neck. He was introduced to glass blowing in Taos and started an apprenticeship with Tony Hohola. He also studied with world-class world -class Northwest Coast Native artist Preston Singletary at Pilchuck Glass School in Washington State. Working with Hohola and Singletary brought forth the many possibilities of incorporating Native designs and themes with techniques of the long-standing European tradition of glass blowing. Today, Lujan's work is highly influenced by everyday scenes of Native America, of this, Iris said, quote, I was fascinated by the movement of hot glass, the way it captures light and the potential of creating native art with this exciting new medium, end quote. 
Next, I have a bowl beautifully crafted by Navajo artist Lorraine Williams. Lorraine's approach to her pottery craft is highly refined, inspired by the traditional and utilitarian wares made by Navajo potters, and through years of practice, she found her artistic voice. This bowl was donated by Shirley Segrin in 2011. In Segrin's collection were many Pueblo, Hopi, and Navajo pottery wares. I'm not sure if she knew Lorraine personally, but Segrin's collection is rich with fine examples of pottery, such as Lorraine's, made by tribal artists from the Southwest. Born in 1955, Lorraine grew up in the Cayenta Tisnos Pass area in Arizona. She did not set out to be a potter and only knew pottery as functional wares used during ceremonies. Like other Navajo pottery wares, hers are covered with pinon pine pitch, which gives them a shiny, more impervious outer shell. For this particular bowl, the more familiar shiny pinon pitch is seen on the interior. The light indented triangle designs reflect her experience as a Navajo weaver. It is after she married George Williams that she realized pottery vessels were made by experienced potters and not purchased from outsiders. George's mother is, a, is Rose Williams, who is a well-known Navajo potter and it is from her that Lorraine's pottery making journey began. Though no longer married to George, she continues to produce pottery vessels with the brown black mesa clay. Nathan Begay, who is both Hopi and Navajo, drew inspiration from both cultures. His research and multicultural background allowed him the freedom to experiment aesthetically while utilizing traditional methods of pottery making. This bowl was formed with micaceous clay and painted on the interior with a red slip. Over that are splashes of white and black slips. The exterior exhibits the natural micaceous clay color over which are many fire clouds, a natural occurrence made during the firing process. Though he created a variety of vessels inspired by traditional Hopi and Navajo pottery, this bowl appears to be inspired by the northern Pueblos, where their clay is rich with mica. Nathan Begay is Hopi from his mother's side and Navajo from his father's side. He grew up near Tuba City in Arizona and was not always accepted by either tribe, though he felt a great connection to both. His path to pottery making began with a vivid dream he had where the setting sun and sky were a bright red color as he walked from one village to another. In one home, he saw an old woman sitting by a fire surrounded by many beautiful pottery pieces. He recalls, quote, as I walked in, she picked one up and handed it to me. Then I woke up. I knew I had to make pottery, end quote. Nathan was a student at the Institute of American Indian Arts where he learned pottery making from an aunt, well-known potter and instructor, Oteli Loloma. Sadly, Nathan passed away at the age of 52 and left behind quite an extensive array of works in clay. Also from the Shirley Segrin collection, this bright and playful kushari figure with watermelon slices was made by Randy Chitto. Randy is from the Choctaw tribe in Mississippi and grew up in Chicago, Illinois after moving there with his family. Though originally focused on painting, he became adept at pottery making while attending the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe in a, cla also, in a class also taught by Oteli Loloma. He continued his studies with clay with instructor Ralph Partington, who was his mentor and friend. Under Mr. Partington, he developed his unique style. His work is recognizable by the expressive, joyful faces he creates and paints and is known for his turtle storytellers, which disguise themselves as bears or as seen here as kosharis or clowns. Randy met his wife, Jackie Carpio, in Otelli's clay class at IAIA. 
Together, they co-founded the Santa Fe Indian Center. Randy's studio is called the Red Clay Studio and is located in Santa Fe, New Mexico, where he resides and is currently the vice chair of the Southwestern Association of Indian Art. Next, I have five pottery works by Preston Duwayani. Preston's works display an ethereal quality. All of his work is thin-walled and elegant. Add to that his shifting sand signature design, and they appear to move as does the sand in the dry desert of the Hopi lands when the wind blows. His use of different colored clay lends his palette choice another added la layer of otherworldliness. It is clear that his work was loved by Shirley Segrin. As mentioned, I chose five of Preston's works. Since Shirley obviously loved to collect them, we have these five in addition to a few others in our collection. What you see is a variety of vessel types, clay varieties, Preston's signature shifting sand design, and use of silver inlay pieces. Most notable is Preston's incredibly well-executed works in clay and delicate placement of the shifting sand design. The black bowl with a single silver inlay piece and the red bowl have an even shine, while the white plate, orange bowl, and black seed bowl are a matte color. They are all well-balanced in form, and I always find it difficult to take my eyes off of them. His use and integration of clay wares with the addition of silver pieces places him outside of the mainstream of traditional potters. Some of his clay works are more sculptural in design. He brings elegance and beauty to the forefront. Of his work, he says, quote, I feel the need to challenge the established world of art and ultimately to make unique contributions. Above all, I want to encourage cultural innovation, offering alternatives in artistic expression through experimentation in various techniques and mediums." End quote. Preston signs his work with a hallmark, which can be seen on the bottom of his wares. What is depicted is an image of a woman carrying a child on her back. Born in 1951 at Hopi's Third Mesa, his home and life were surrounded by the traditional crafts of his parents. His mother was a prominent basket weaver and his father an important kachina carver. Primarily raised in central Arizona, he later attended school at the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe. He went on to further his education at the Colorado State University in Fort Lewis. In 1988, he returned to IAIA as a professor of traditional pottery and jewelry. His recognizable works have received the highest of awards. Zuni Pueblo artist Alan Lassalu created this tall jar utilizing Zuni white clay. Though the jar was made into this form in a traditional coil clay manner, Allen utilizes two innovative techniques he discovered by accident. The silky look and feel of the jar are due to his use of a chamois cloth to polish the exterior. The pale yellow cream and ash gray coloring seen on this jar was an aesthetic note brought on by an accident when he spilled grease on an unfired pottery piece. After firing, this was the result, an almost iridescent subtle pattern. He seized the opportunity to add a contemporary and new approach to his designs. This beautiful jar was purchased by Shirley Segrin from Allen directly at Santa Fe Indian Market. At the age of 13, Lassalu began as a fetish carver, a well-known tradition at the Pueblo of Zuni. He attended the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe, where a pottery class he took evolved into a career as a potter and clay sculptor. In 1999, upon returning to the Zuni Pueblo after studying fashion design at the American College for the Applied Arts in Los Angeles, in Los Angeles, Lassalu began modifying traditional pottery forms. He says, quote, I try to utilize what I have learned about fashion design by using lines, curves, and pleats in my clay sculptures. This creates movement and brings life to the pieces, 
End quote. On to the final contemporary work from our collection, Marla Allison's Light and Shadow is a big leap forward for an artist whose primary expressions are composed with acrylic paints on canvas. The large skylight cover features Laguna Pueblo and Hopi pottery designs printed over a plastic substrate. A welded steel frame holds it together with a single metal rod in a zigzag shape crossing from left to right. The center is fortunate to have purchased this remarkable work from the artist from her 2017 exhibition titled Consumed by Design. In that exhibition, in our Artists Circle Gallery, light and shadow was installed high above the viewer's sightline, delicately dangling from the high ceiling in our, in our rotunda. The light from above filtered through the slightly transparent film of plastic, allowing the dark Pueblo designs to shine. Marla Allison is from the B Laguna Pueblo here in New Mexico, and her prolific portfolio of work is inspired by traditions, cultural displacement, and the human experience. Her desire to work collaboratively with other artists and free-thinking individuals like herself has led her all over the world. Her openness to other cultures and their artistic endeavors allowed for a life of travel and participation in group and solo exhibitions in places such as Chiapas, Mexico, Bristol in the United Kingdom, Abu Dhabi in the United Arab Emirates, and Riyadh in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. In her artist statement, she says, quote, my art is what lets me connect the past to my future. My paintings are based on the contemporary which borrows from the past. I paint so I remember where I came from. I paint so others can remember where I come from. I paint to be remembered." End quote. Marla says it best. The forward movement of contemporary Native American artists doesn't necessarily mean they leave behind the roots and basis of their art forms. Our contemporary Native American artists respect their ancestors who are the source of knowledge upon which they continue to build their cultural identities and expressions. I hope you enjoyed the magnificent works I chose for you this month, because I sure did. I will return in December with a selection of Pueblo Nativity sets in celebration of the Christmas holiday. Thank you so much.